Gurun Militam Jena Tazmai Shri Gurabe Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manubhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Juta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Nitam Ischa Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravane Pracharane Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Paschata De Shatarane Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namane Shri Barshabana Bi Devi Dayataya Kripabdaye Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Dayane Prabhave Namaha Madhurya Jvala Premadya Shri Rupanuga Bhakti Da Shri Gora Kokya Karuna Shakti Svigrahaya Namo Stute Namo Gora Kishoraya Shakshad Vairagya Murtaye Vipralamba Rasambode Padam Bujaya Te Namaha Namo Bhakti Vinodaya Satchidananda Namane Gora Shakti Swarupaya Rupanuga Varayate Vanchakalpa Triubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayavacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Namo Mahavaranyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namane Gorat Vishena Maha Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha Jagat Hitaya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Namaha He Krishna Karuna Sindo Dina Bando Jagat Pate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo Stute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Brinda Banishwari, Brishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye. So it's a privilege to be able to speak to you. Thank you. I was at the Prabhupada. I was at the Prabhupada festival about three or four years ago, I think, and when I came out, Shruti Kirti and, and, um, uh, and Hari Basara, or no, Hari Sari, uh, were there at the, at the temple, and they had just uh, produced a, a book about their memories of Prabhupada. And they said, Vaikuntanath, why don't you, it's very good for your purification to write down your memories of Srila Prabhupada. So they encouraged me to do that, and I was, I'm very grateful to them for that, because it was very purifying and very beneficial for me to sit down and uh, re- recollect my memories of Srila Prabhupada. And I've just produced this book. So the purpose of my talk tonight is to promote my book, which is my memories of Srila Prabhupada. And I have them available. They're $11, most welcome if anyone is interested. So basically tonight, what I'm really doing is going to read, mostly read to you from the book. Uh, This is the first chapter. In the presence of Prabhupada, 
one could have no anxieties, for anxieties evaporated as one entered his room. As one arose from their bow, lifting their head from the floor, a wave of joy overcame them. Prabhupada's huge smile, arising from his complete realization of his spiritual nature, greeted them. For what reason are we anxious? Because we have forgotten that we are spirit souls. Srila Prabhupada had fully realized his eternal soul and his eternal relationship of love with Sri Krishna. And thus, Srila Prabhupada was joyful with no limits or restraints. One may have entered the room carrying the normal bundle of cares and worries that generally sit at the back of one's mind. But upon lifting one's head from the floor and feeling the wave of Prabhupada's joyful and divine presence, one's heart simply melted and all anxiety was gone. Is this too close? Is this okay? Prabhupada was in a fully liberated state Prabhupada's state of consciousness was entirely different from that of ordinary humans. He was floating in fully conscious spiritual bliss. He was in the samadhi, trance, of Krishna consciousness. His trance was not at all broken by activity as would happen to a meditating yogi. The yogi must remain motionless in a meditative posture in, in his cave or ashram. But Prabhupada's Samadhi was fully manifest in all his actions. All his motions and activities were done as pure devotional service for Sri Krishna in the Samadhi of divine love. He saw Krishna and Krishna's purpose in everything. Prabhupada might do something as simple as lifting an item from the table or just scratching his head. In even these smallest of movements, one saw that Prabhupada was fully liberated, spontaneous, and free. He was situated in a state of transcendental bliss. He was beyond the limitations of lamentation. His mind was not forced into the restrictions of mundane time that arise for one who hankers and laments. Prabhupada was fully in the present moment and performed every action, big or small, fully conscious and attentive and with immense gracefulness. No mundane hankering or lamentation could touch him, nor pull him from this presence, for he was in the direct company of Sri Krishna. After bowing down in obeisance upon entering Prabhupada's room, the student would then sit cross-legged on the floor, before Prabhupada and observe through one's just opened consciousness the field of energy, the aura of love, and the divine presence that reached out from Prabhupada to all corners of the room. The room itself had, in truth, been transformed into the spiritual realm. Prabhupada's miracle was that matter transformed into spiritual energy in his presence. Gross, inert matter was transformed into chintamani, spiritual substance. Within those four walls, a small corner of the mundane world had melted and the divine Vaikuntha realm had incarnated. For sitting in that room was a divine being of such incredible purity and love that Vaikuntha simply flowed through him into the room. Everyone in the room felt it fully and everyone in the room was transformed. As we sat, Prabhupada would talk, and Prabhupada would laugh, and Prabhupada would enliven our souls. Every word he spoke was perfection. Every move he made was of the utmost gracefulness, and he was just full of kindness and love. For even an ant, he had kindness and love. And for human beings, he had overflowing kindness and love. Everyone felt it. Even the briefest encounter with Srila Prabhupada was absolutely charmed. Boston, May of 1968. The temple was billowing, full of frankincense, 
not the stick incense, but the kind that is placed on a heated charcoal, and thick, fragrant smoke filled the entire room of that small storefront temple in Boston, May of 1968. The kirtan was roaring. It was the unhurried, deep, mellow style kirtan as Prabhupada would chant. The devotees were completely absorbed in the transcendental sound vibration. When chanting Hare, they heard Hare. And when chanting Krishna, they heard Krishna because their minds were locked in the mantra. Their minds were not wandering, but were fixed in the holy names. They were in the transcendental state. We were feeling the presence of our Guru Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. He had not yet arrived at the temple, but he was on the way. And that was good enough for us to let go of every care we ever had and to dive deeply into the holy name. Suddenly, the temple's front door opens and the thrill overwhelms us for his divine and holy grace has just arrived. Flowing saffron chatter wrapped gracefully across his shoulder, big bead bag in his right hand, and the biggest smile in human history beaming upon his radiant and joyful face. We all hit the floor, bowing in prayer, with tears flowing from our eyes and joy filling our soul. Not even for one moment does his smile lessen as Prabhupada enters and walks forward through the th fragrant, rich frankincense that we had purchased from a Greek Orthodox church. Before the deities Jagannath, Subhadra, and Balaram, Prabhupada pauses with hands in prayer, then with his knees and head to the floor in pranama to the Lord of the universe. The kirtan then resumes, the tears continue to fall, and Prabhupada's smile has still not lessened as he sits upon the seat of Vyas at the head of the temple. Moments later, in his deep, soulful, and yet jolly voice, Prabhupada welcomes us with the utmost warmth and kindness, and we are just so glad to be there. The same miraculous phenomena has occurred once again. The room has melted, and the spiritual realm has again descended, and everything is joyous. As Prabhupada begins to speak, everyone's attention is fixed on every syllable and word. With the utmost gravity and depth during that, this profound address, Srila Prabhupada states, while chanting Krishna's holy name in kirtan, we should be praying, O oh Krishna, please place me in, in the society of your service. When Srila Prabhupada said this, we realized he was revealing to us the secret key, the true way to approach Krishna, and that in this mood, we could actually enter into the presence of the mantra. There's nothing deeper than that. What is it that normally keeps us from entering into the presence of the mantra. It's the various small, selfish, egoistic thoughts and desires that we hold on to. Only when we truly desire to serve Krishna do all of the small, selfish desires that are covering our consciousness actually fall away and we come into the presence of the holy name. Even if we are desiring to enter transcendence as we chant, there remains self-interest in that desire. It is still what we want. Only when we let go of all thoughts regarding what we want and simply desire to serve Krishna do we actually enter into the transcendental realm of the Maha Mantra. With this supremely important key that Prabhupada granted us that evening, we again began to chant with no other desire than to serve Krishna. Every, everyone in that room went deeply into transcendence by Prabhupada's grace, and that kirtan was like the nectar of Amrita. 
One of the things I think in wanting to give a talk like this is just to share the tremendous joy uh, it, w- it was to be in Prabhupada's presence. People who didn't have that opportunity, they must wonder, what was, that, what was it like? And it was just the most wonderful, glorious experience to be with Prabhupada. And he, Prabhupada has the most beautiful smile. And there's a photograph, a nice picture of Prabhupada's smile in the book. So, for me, it was really very lucky timing. Uh, my, I grew up in Los Angeles, but my father got a promotion, and his company, Harper & Row, they had their headquarters in New York. So, he moved there in early 1966, and I, the, our, our family stayed back and finished school, and in June of 66, we moved from Los Angeles to New York. And naturally, uh, you know, I was 17 years old, and uh, actually, I think I was 16 when we moved there. And and naturally, one goes out and starts exploring the new, new found place. And exploring around, I found the devotees chanting in the park and in the summer of 1966. And it kind of shocked me, because in that, at that time, everyone was growing their hair long. So I felt there was a real message in the shaved heads. But I I didn't give it much more thought than that. What happened about four or five months later, I I, uh, traveled out back to California, San Francisco. And there I found a job selling a newspaper called The Oracle. And The Oracle was kind of a hippie philosophical newspaper. But it uh, was quite popular in the Haight-Ashbury district. And I got a job selling it. And this, there was an ad in the uh, Oracle advertising Prabhupada's record. So I, I, was, I saved one copy of that Oracle, so I have that in the book. Um, So what happened was I went out to, to uh, uh, California, uh, uh, and uh, what happened was the first time I entered the temple, ever entered the temple, was I, I, was, I went into the temple, I saw people were inside, and I asked them, anyone want to buy an oracle? Little did I know that I was trying to sell them something with Krishna consciousness in it, in, in the, one of the back pages. So that was kind of humorous. Uh, but in any case, I went back to the San Francisco temple a number of times, and I began to realize that it was a very, very powerful place of spiritual enlightenment and spiritual realization. And I encountered some devotees. Lilavati was talking to a group of young people about her wonderful encounter with the Swamiji. And so when I returned a month or two later to New York, and I was in a little shop, I found the Back to Godhead magazine. And I remembered, oh, yeah, that Lilavati in San Francisco said that the Swamiji, as he was known in those days, the Swamiji has a center in New York. So I immediately headed off trying to find the, the, uh, the New York, try to find the, the New York center of, um, of Krishna consciousness. And I went down McDougal Street and down Bleecker Street and got lost. But finally, I came out on 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street, 26th 2nd Avenue. And I thought, later, that's a befitting place, 2nd and 2nd, for the teacher of Madhvacharya's dualism. And then I walked a short way down the block between 1st and 2nd, sort of fine-tuning the metaphor to Lord Chaitanya's Achinta Beta Beta Tattva, because the 26th 2nd Avenue was right between 1st Street and 2nd Street on 2nd Avenue. But I, I, uh, I, I didn't join the, uh, the, the temple then. Uh, well, actually, what happened was when I arrived, when I, when I went into the temple, they told me that Prabhupada was coming in, in a couple of days. And uh, so I went out with the devotees to LaGuardia Airport and uh, was there when Prabhupada arrived. But at that time, it was all very new to me. And it was a big crowd, and, and Prabhupada was sort of in the distance. But I saw him give his beautiful smile and wave. 
And back at the temple, also, there was a lot of devotees. So, you know, it was uh, very, very new to me. I had just been introduced to Krishna consciousness. And uh, family distractions, and uh, they wanted me to go to college. I, I entered college in the, the uh, September of, of uh, 67. But I, I decided I didn't want to stay in college. Rather, I was more interested in spiritual life. I went back to the temple and met some nice devotees there, Devananda, Ray Rama, and they invited me. They said, you know, you can dedicate yourself to this. You're welcome. You know, they, when they gave the philosophy, I thought, this is such a... This, this, is, this, this philosophy makes such perfect sense, yet no one else is teaching this. I realized that this is, this is where I could really, this is something that I was very interested in. And so I, I, I left college and I, I joined the temple. And at that time, of course, there were no Tulsi beads from India available. So, it, so my first engagement that next morning was to string together my set of Japa beads. And they engaged me in typing. I had learned typing in, in uh, high school. They engaged me in typing at the Back to Godhead office. And I remember the great blessing that I was introduced to Lord Chaitanya as Ray Rama had me type from the introduction about the short life sketch of Lord Chaitanya. But I was, again, very young, and I had wanderlust. I was an adult for the first time, so I, I left the temple after about a week or ten days, and I hitchhiked out to, out west, stopping at the Santa Fe, New Mexico temple run by Sioux Ball, and then I, I stopped at the, uh, at the Los Angeles Temple on Pico Boulevard and saw Wumapiti there. Uh, I even went to Hawaii. I, somehow I, I had to raise the money for the ticket, and I flew to Hawaii, went up to the North Shore, Sunset Beach. I, I met a yogi. He called himself a yogi. And he said, I'm staying in this uh, abandoned building. You're welcome to stay with me. He introduced me to his friend, who later turned out to be one of Prabhupada's very important disciples, Siddha Swarup Ananda. And uh, I, I had the fortune of seeing him. He was very absorbed, and he, he had Prabhupada's record, uh, the, the happening record, and, and uh, he was very absorbed in that. I didn't get to know him, just brief, briefly met him. As I was there in Hawaii, I realized this is a paradise here. You know, coconut palm trees and beautiful waves and birds and flowers, such a paradise. I said, but my true happiness is going to be found in the holy name of Krishna. And I decided, and I returned to New York, to 26 Second Avenue. And then after maybe two, three weeks in the temple there in Second Avenue, again I got this urge to travel. So the devotees said, well, why don't you dovetail that urge? Why, there's a nice temple in Boston. Why don't you go up and travel up there? So I took their advice and I went up to Boston and, and uh, there there were three, three very nice devotees, Satsvarupa, Pradumna, and Jadurani. And Satsvarupa would get up every morning at three and type on the dic Prabhupada's uh, uh, transcriptions on the dictaphone. And uh, Pradumna was deep in his study of Sanskrit. Later he became Prabhupada's Sanskrit editor. And Jadurani was a prolific artist a, a magnificent artist did many, many paintings of Krishna. She would work 15, 16 hours a day. Very dedicated people there in Boston. But when I heard that Prabhupada had, gone, had come to San Francisco, I couldn't resist, because he had been in India uh, you know, after 1967. He went back to India, I think, around June or something of 67. And he didn't return until the end of the year or the beginning of the next year. And when I heard that Prabhupada got, had come to San Francisco, I couldn't resist. I hitchhiked back out to San Francisco. And I went to the temple. At that time, the society was so small that the East Coast and West Coast devotees all knew each other because they corresponded with letters. And so they knew that I, Jadarani had written that, you know, we have one new recruit, John. He's on his way to San Francisco. So they, they knew of me when I came, and they welcomed me. They brought me doll, rice doll and japatis. I felt very at home in San Francisco Temple. 
And they told me, you can meet Srila Prabhupada. And I was very pleasantly surprised to see that it, was, it was, wasn't too difficult to be able to go meet Prabhupada. So I'll read on a little bit from the book. I was informed that I could meet Srila Prabhupada. I was amazed that it would be so easy. One devotee led me along Frederick Street and up Willard Street to Srila Prabhupada's residence. Up the stairs I went and through the curtains when I fell, where I fell to the ground in obeisance, as slowly I arose with hands in prayer, my eyes delighted to see the most beautiful and radiant being sitting before me. An effulgent golden aura emanated from him and filled the room with brightness. He sat in the middle of that aura and seemed to be afloat in a state of divine ecstasy. I felt like I was encountering a being from a higher world. I felt that I was in the presence of a divine and royal king. I felt as though I had entered another dimension of existence. Guru Das was in the room and two or three other devotees. They all smiled knowingly at me that I too had found the treasure. Prabhupada smiled at me as his head gently floated and his hands gracefully moved in his state of full self-realization. It was like being in the presence of a fully enlightened Buddha. In fact, what I witnessed was a being from the spiritual world and a room that had been transformed into Vaikuntha by his presence. So after some time, my, myself and the others who were there, we bowed to leave. We were just overwhelmed. Walking down Willard Street, we just couldn't believe our good fortune that we had actually just met a fully enlightened, pure devotee of the Lord. So Prabhupada had invited me. He, he invited me to stay with the San Francisco devotees. But, but after having seen Srila Prabhupada, I realized that I, I have to go wherever he's going. I have to see more of Srila Prabhupada. So he was heading in a few days for New York. So I immediately flew back to New York. And, and uh, I was a little nervous at the airport because he had encouraged me to stay in the San Francisco temple. But he immediately recognized me with my freshly shaved head and welcomed me most warmly. So we, he came to, to uh, New York for about two weeks or so, two or three weeks, and uh, we just got to bask in the transcendental joyous rays of Prabhupada's presence. Uh, we made a... Uh, the, the one program was down at Temple University in Philadelphia, and uh, Hans Aduda, a very nice devotee, he asked me... Uh, he says, do you have a vehicle? And I was able to borrow my parents Volkswagen van and I took some of the devotees down to Temple University. Prabhupada went with, with some devotees on the train and that was a wonderful program. And after two weeks or three weeks in New York, then Prabhupada went to Boston. And I'll read on a little bit. From New York, Srila Prabhupada went to the small Glenville Avenue ISKCON Temple in Boston's Alston area. Sasvarupa, Jadarani, and Pradumna, who I mentioned earlier, had rented a small house nearby for Srila Prabhupada to stay in. I had decided that I wanted to ask for initiation. So I walked over to Srila Prabhupada's house. I informed Prabhupada's servant, Gorsundar Das, of my intention, and he invited me to go inside and, and personally make my 
request known to Srila Prabhupada. I was nervous, but I was also determined, as I did not want to lose any more time in the uninitiated state. I entered Prabhupada's room, where he sat alone. I bowed down, and as I arose, my state of mind was transformed. All of my anxiety vanished. My nervousness disappeared. I was enraptured by his divinity and his overflowing grace. In Prabhupada's presence, everything magically changed. Suddenly there was no cause for anxiety. Suddenly there was no reason to be nervous. Suddenly everything seemed to be joyous and wonderful. Suddenly I remembered that I am an eternal spirit soul and that I was in the presence of Lord Krishna's representative. It struck me at that moment that all the great men of the material world are like mere twigs before Srila Prabhupada. His presence was so powerful, so enlightened, so jubilant, so loving. The holy name of Krishna was always on his lips. As I arose after bowing down, thrilled to be in the presence of this great spiritual master, my spiritual master, I asked Srila Prabhupada if he would kindly accept me as his initiated disciple. Srila Prabhupada nodded his head in great warmth and affirmation. I felt that my request was not a surprise to Srila Prabhupada, that he was expecting it, as I had been following him for some weeks now, and he could recognize that I was surrendering unto him. And so it was a wonderful month, 1968, the month of May in, in uh, Boston. Sasvarupa, who was a great organizer and leader, he had arranged many public lectures at MIT, at Harvard, Boston University, Boston College, Brandeis. There was a place called the Cambridge International Center we went to a couple times. And also at places like the Arlington Street Church, which is a prominent church in Boston. And we had many programs that whole month uh, around Boston. And I recall that one evening we had a uh, talk at, at uh, I believe it was Boston University. It may have been Boston College, but I think it was Boston University. I don't know the names. And very few people showed up. It was like hardly anybody showed up. And after the program, we were all disappointed. We went to Prabhupada, apologized that very few people had showed up. Prabhupada, with a gleam in his eye, he said, didn't you see? Narada Muni was there. And everyone joyously chanted, said, Hare Krishna. Hello. Hare Krishna. Um, but from, from um, that month in, in Boston, then Prabhupada went to Montreal. And the Montreal temple was an old bowling alley. It was on the third floor on the corner of Avenue du Parc and Avenue du Pine. It's a French-speaking place, part of French-speaking part of Canada. And this old bowling alley had been rented by the temple, and the floor was flattened, and there were cloths hung to create walls so that the brahmacharis would have some living quarters. And I remember one, one time Hansa Duda came up with a brilliant idea. He lined all of the stairs on both sides, going three flights up, and then inside the temple room and all throughout the temple complex, he put along the, the walls little votive candles, or little birthday candles or votive, small candles. And as Prabhupada was just expected to come, he had all those candles lit, and it just looked incredibly beautiful. And Prabhupada was beaming. He said, who has, who has uh, done this? And before anyone could even say Hansa Duda, Prabhupada said, the Krishna has guided them in the heart. Prabhupada was very pleased by that. 
I remember on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Prabhupada would come to the temple and he would always deliver a wonderful speech and lecture. And I remember one time he, he was talking, he said, everyone knows that God is great, but they don't know how great he is. And I remember when he said that, it, was, it wasn't just what he said, but the way Prabhupada said it that was so absolutely amazing, full of realization, full of understanding. So that was a wonderful, it was three months that we had with Prabhupada in Montreal. We all realized that we had found something very, very rare. We had found a genuine, fully enlightened, fully realized saint and spiritual master, a pure devotee of the Lord. We all realized that we were very, very fortunate. We just loved to be in his presence. In his presence, we were released from all anxieties, worries, and cares, and were gifted with complete and utter faith in the certainty and reality of God. On many occasions, we sat with Prabhupada in his rooms on Rue Prince Arthur. Prabhupada would engage in various discussions with his visitors, presenting in many ways the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. We felt in incredibly joyful in his presence simply because he was so joyful. He was absolutely free of all anxiety. We felt extremely happy when the opportunity arose to visit Prabhupada. I remember in Montreal, we were visiting with Prabhupada one time and he said, have full faith, you will reach perfection. And he said another time, he said, just like a baby cries with a certain intensity, and the mother will give up whatever she's doing. She may ignore the baby at first, but when there's a certain intensity that's reached, she'll give up everything and pick up the baby. So we have to cry for Krishna with that same kind of intensity, like a baby for its mother. He said, otherwise we'll spend life after life. And another time he told a story about this man who was on a roof doing some work, and all of a sudden, he started to slip. He started to slide down the roof. Oh, oh God, save me. And he's praying, please save me, God. And all of a sudden, he's, his belt is caught by a nail on the roof and stops his fall. And he said, oh, God, never mind. And Prabhupada laughed. He said, we're so quick to remember God in, when there's danger, but as soon as the danger's gone, we forget God. Never mind without realizing that God saved him from the fall by using that nail. That nail. The, uh, had the World's Fair in 1967 and 68 in, in Montreal. And Prabhupada thought this was a perfect forum for a for perfect uh, situation for, for spreading Krishna consciousness. And in fact, we were accepted by the, the administration that invited us to come. And, and actually paid the temple to, for us to come. But there's a, uh, I saved the article from the Montreal Star, July of 1968, and I have the article in the book uh, showing a photograph of Prabhupada surrounded by the devotees chanting. On one particular afternoon, several devotees we're sitting with Srila Prabhupada in his room. Of course, on a regular basis in the afternoon, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday, Prabhupada uh, came to the temple to speak. And on the other days, we could go to Prabhupada's apartment and be with Prabhupada. So on one particular afternoon, several of the devotees were sitting with Srila Prabhupada in his room. Because of various duties and responsibilities, one by one, devotees left the room. 
Soon it was time for Srila Prabhupada to go to the temple for kirtan and to speak. To my surprise, Srila Prabhupada's servants explained that they had to finish doing some cleaning work and that they would come to the temple shortly. It was me alone who was to accompany Srila Prabhupada on his walk to the temple. I, I just couldn't believe my good fortune. My head began to swirl. And I kept thinking to myself, what an unbelievable opportunity to walk alone with Srila Prabhupada, to accompany a pure devotee of the Lord, to be in the divine presence of a self-realized soul, alone, with none of the other devotees along. As we walked, I thought to myself, now is the perfect opportunity for me to ask any question I have. So I thought hard and deeply. But I realized that I had no questions. <laughs> In Srila Prabhupada's presence, all questions were answered. All that I needed to know was already revealed. I am a spirit soul. Krishna is God. My purpose is to serve Krishna and to take shelter of Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet. But still, I thought this opportunity was so great that I should ask some question, but I just couldn't come up with a profound question. Perhaps a, a question about the structure of the universe or something. For all, all such questions seemed unnecessary or secondary to what Prabhupada had revealed about Krishna and Vrindavan. Finally, I blurted out, Swamiji, would it be a good idea for us to practice hatha yoga for our health? By this time, we had rounded the corner from Rupa Prince Arthur and turned on to Avenue du Parc. Srila Prabhupada was walking with his cane in the left hand and his bead bag in his right hand. Up until then, neither of us had spoken a word. When I asked this question, Srila Prabhupada, smiling warmly, looked at me and said, if you dance nicely at kirtan, you'll be very healthy. It was a kind of a frivolous thing for me to ask. I couldn't think of anything, so I, I asked about hatha yoga. <laughs> but Prabhupada didn't encourage it. He said, dance, if you dance at kirtan, that's all you need for your health. You'll be very, very healthy. He didn't want to start, get us to start opening hatha yoga centers. In any case, it was a, a long and, and glorious uh, summer, wonderful summer, that whole summer, from June, July, and August. And so many uh, prominent ISKCON dev devotees, you know, uh, were there at that center. Uh, Gopal Krishna Maharaj used to, that's where he joined, and he would come and he was very advanced right from the beginning. He would stand in front of the pictures of Krishna and just chant for about 20 minutes, and then he'd move to the next picture and ch chant. And Jaya Pataka came, went to the Rathiatra in the summer of 68 in San Francisco. And immediately after the Rathiatra, he asked, where is Prabhupada? And they said, Montreal. He flew on the next plane to Montreal, immediately surrendered. And Hansaduda was there. And Kirtan Anand and Hayagriva came there. They're the ones who started New Vrindavan. And, and the devotees who went to London, Shamsundar and Malati, Gurudas and Yamuna, and Mukunda, who was Prabhupada's first devotee in America, and his wife, Janaki, they came to Montreal on their way to London, where they were being sent by Prabhupada to fulfill Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaja's desire to have Krishna consciousness well established in the heart and headquarters of the, British Empire, the old British Empire that had been Bhakti Siddhanta's desire. And so they were, they stopped, they were, had opened up the San Francisco temple, and then on their way to London, they, they uh, st stopped in Montreal. And it was just a wonderful summer, fantastic summer. And then after, at the end of the summer, after John Mostomy, uh, Srila Prabhupada, you know, left at that point. And shortly thereafter, I, I wrote a letter to Prabhupada. I said, what is the best way I could serve you? And Prabhupada immediately wrote back a letter. He said, I'm starting ISKCON Press, but I still don't have a book binder. So I would like you to go to New York, stay with the press devotees, learn book binding, so you could be the book binder at ISKCON Press. 
And he gave the same directions to a devotee named Patita Udaran, who also went to learn bookbinding. So the two of, of us, me and Patita Udaran, were the bookbinders at ISKCON Press. And at that time, we still didn't know where the press would actually be. And Hari Griva and Kirtananda had been directed to open up New Vrindavan on the land they had acquired in West Virginia. So one possibility was to go to, uh, to open the press at, at, uh, in at New Vrindavan in West Virginia. So one day I, I went down with Adoita, the printer, and Udava, the, 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 the layout man and, and photography man for the press, and Nara Narayan, who is ISKCON's uh, building and engineering genius, and uh, another devotee, we went down and looked in, in, to, to consider having ISKCON press at New Vrindavan, but we realized it was much too rugged. You know, the roads were just full of potholes and ponds and tur twists and turns, and it would have been very difficult to have a press there. Um, but in, anyway, that was quite an adventure. And... I remember when we went up to, to, to uh, New Vrindavan at that time, we arrived, because driving from New York was the whole day drive, we arrived, it was already dark when we arrived, and New Vrindavan was about three miles up the road, this country, old country road, and it was dark, it was still winter, and it was snow on the ground, and we, the, the four or five of us devotees, hiked up to New Vrindavan, but we didn't realize we were about 30 feet away from the road, and we, we were walking along parallel to the road through the forest, <laughs> And it was, it was quite, a, quite a job to get there in the middle of the night. In any case, ultimately, ISKCON Press was opened in Boston. The, the ISKCON Society purchased a, an old Victorian uh, house and established ISKCON Press there. And uh, it was a wonder, that was a wonderful period. Many, many devotees were there doing different parts of the, of the press operation. And uh, Prabhupada was very pleased with it. A lot of books and magazines were printed there. The first volume of the Sri Ishopanishad, various segments from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada, returning from London, Prabhupada had gone over because things were happening so, imp such important things were happening in London with the temple being successfully built there and the Beatles contributing their, their efforts to establish it. So Prabhupada had gone to, to uh, London and then on his way back, he stopped at Logan Airport to go to visit ISKCON Press. And that was just a huge success. I mean, it's, you know, when, when, when the devotees met Prabhupada at the Boston Airport, there was such enthusiasm and such joy to, to, uh, to meet Prabhupada. And after Prabhupada uh, left Boston, in, in December of 1969 and went back out to California. After that, I didn't see Srila Prabhupada for three long years. Uh, I, I worked with ISKCON Press for about a year, and then we were sent to Trinidad. Trinidad is a wonderful place. I didn't know anything about it when I was sent there. Myself and my wife, we, we went down to, to Trinidad uh, absolutely with not any idea of, of who lived in Trinidad or what it was like. When we got there, we were, we were just w wonderfully surprised to discover that it was a place where when you walk down the street, you don't say hello or hi. You say, Ram, Ram, Sita, Ram. It's a very Vedic, very uh, 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 Krishna conscious place. Trinidad is, uh, you know, back in the 19th century and early 20th century, there were uh, huge numbers of people from India who, sh who moved over to Trinidad and they brought with them the whole Indian culture. And the first person we met, we didn't know anybody there, the first person we met arranged for us a place to stay at this Hindu temple. And the second person we met was named Simbunath Kapaldeo. He was an important man in Trinidad. He was a barrister, and he was well known in Trinidad. And he, he and his wife took us around and showed us Port of Spain, drove us and gave us a grand welcome. But the high point was when he took us to his home and invited us into his library. And while we were in his library, he very proudly reached 
to the shelf and pulled out the three volumes of Prabhupada's Srimad Bhagavatam printed in Delhi back in the, before he came to America. And we discovered that Prabhupada had been in touch and correspondence with Simbunath Kapodeo and was even considering coming to Trinidad before he came to America. And we thought, this is the Guru's presence in separation because you don't need the Guru physically present. Prabhupada always emphasized that. The Guru is present with us. And this was to me an example of Prabhupada. There's over a million people in, Gaya, in Trinidad and, and the second person we met had been in touch with Prabhupada. About uh, after we were in, in uh, Trinidad for a, about a, a month, this was, uh, we went there in, in December of 1970. Uh, after about a month there, um, Kanapri and his wife Chaitanya Dasi came down and joined us. We decided that they would open up the Trinidad Center and we went to Guyana. Guyana is like Trinidad. It also has a huge number of uh, people from India and Indian culture and a great love for Indian culture and Mother India. In Guyana, the first person we met, Narayan Sadhu, provided us with a place to stay. The second person we met there, Dr. Baldwan Singh, also a very important man, he heard that we had arrived the next morning. I don't know, I have any idea how he knew that we had come. The next morning he came over to Narayan Sadhu's house and he had a letter that he had just received from Prabhupada. And he was also in touch with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada told him that, that he had uh, uh, students in Trinidad and please bring them to Guyana. And it was a miracle, really, if you think about it, that we go to Trinidad and Guyana and the second person we met in both place, places were in, was in touch with Prabhupada. I mean, what is the chances of us of that happening? Uh, you know, in, in both those countries have about a million people in them each. Yet, so that, so I, I, I titled the uh, chapter that talks about our trips to Guyana and Trinidad as uh, his, pre his presence in separation. Yeah, because that's a very important theme in spiritual life, is to feel the presence of the Guru even in separation. Well, after a year, we, we uh, returned from Trinidad because our visa had run out. And our plan was to, to get a, uh, a visa extension back at the embassy in New York and return to Trinidad. In the meantime, while we were gone, Patita Pavana Prabhu, who lives here in Daly City now, and another devotee, Shurish Resta, they came and were staying in, in, in Trinidad uh, while we were gone. But when we got back to New York, we were directed by the temple, by the leadership, that Prabhupada had just requested 50 devotees to go to India because things were opening up very big in the Holy Land. Bland had been purchased in Mayapur. The property had been acquired in Juhu Beach, Mumbai. Big things were happening in India and Prabhupada wanted 50 devotees to immediately come. So we were recruited for that project and we worked very hard for about a month or so and raised the airfare, saving every penny. And we flew, there was groups that flew from the west coast and groups that flew from the east coast. About 50 devotees all landed in, in, in India. There already were a lot of devotees there because devotees had, had and large numbers had started coming uh, in 1970. You know, we weren't the first ones there. There were other devotees that were there. And I remember r arriving in Juhu Airport, Santa Cruz Airport, and getting off in the middle of the night, that wall of heat. Wall of heat, you know how hot India gets, and it was very hot in, uh, in April. And the taxi, all, all the taxi drivers welcomed us, anxious to get passengers, and we were drove to Juhu Beach, there under the coconut palm trees on the Arabian Sea, very beautiful. And the, all the devotees stayed in a bamboo hut in the center of the property by the Arabian Sea. And so many uh, activities uh, were going on because the property had been acquired, but the temple had yet to be built. And there were devotees there uh, 
I missed with starting the life membership program and getting people involved. And one of the pr programs had been to, I, I went with Gargamuni and his team, and we went to, to uh, Ahmedabad in Gujarat, and, and uh, then we went to Jamnagar. And after the programs were over, we had these big programs at, at, at this uh, industrialist factory. And it was a big program, and they all became life members. Uh, but after the program was over, we were right near Dwarka. So I went uh, with my wife to Dwarka, and they said, well, you know, Westerners can't enter the temple unless you're a Hindu. And they said, are you Hindu? And, we, and of course, they saw we were Hindu. Not that we're Hindu, but Vedic. Um, and uh, we said, okay, you have to sign uh, on an affidavit in front of the mayor of Dwarka that you're Hindu and that you're pure vegetarian. And once we signed that, we got the royal treatment. The mayor himself escorted us into the temple and showed us Dwarkanath. And they gave us a whole tour. The mayor and his entourage showed us around. So it was wonderful to see Sri Dwarka. But in any case, as I mentioned to you, we hadn't seen Prabhupada for three years since uh, December of 69. And now we, we, we went to India in 72, April, but by the time the, the autumn rolled around, the month of Kartik, Dambodar, uh, we heard news that Prabhupada was going to return to India straight to Vrindavan for the whole month of Kartik, and he was going to give discourses on Srila Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu for the whole month. So we immediately determined to end our long separation, bought tickets for Vrindavan and headed to Vrindavan. So this is after, I, we didn't know what day he was, Prabhupada was coming. We just heard that he was going to come. We knew it should, be, uh, it should be soon. But that's all the information we could get. So we went to Vrindavan. We were you know, there for a number of days. And I was circumambulating Radha Dhamadar. How many of you have been to Radha Damodar in Vrindavan? You know, okay. Of course, Vrindavan was established originally with seven wonderful temples by the six Goswamis. And Radha Damodar was one of those original temples, and that's where Prabhupada's home and headquarters was and is, you know, uh, before he came to America and after he came to America and eternally. I was circumambulating Radha Damodar, chanting on my Tulsi beads, while passing the Samadhi Mandirs of Krishna Das Kaviraj and Jiva Goswami. Their Samadhi Mandirs are right there. I had just stepped through the small passageway back into the temple courtyard. You know, where that big courtyard and there's the little passageways that goes back where Rupa Goswami's Bhajan Kutir and Samadhi is. And from there you go through the little passageway. And I was just entering there, back into the temple courtyard. Suddenly, at the same moment, Srila Prabhupada appeared as he entered the temple courtyard through the large central front doors. We knew that Srila Prabhupada was arriving soon, but we did not know which day. Suddenly, in his flowing saffron robes and glorious divine radiance, surrounded in a golden aura, Prabhupada arrived. He was accompanied on both sides by an entourage of disciples. There was nothing more exciting in the entire world than this. The sudden appearance of the Lord's pure devotee. Immediately I was filled with an overwhelming thrill and an overwhelming joy to be alive. What a stupendous surprise. Suddenly Srila Prabhupada was there, effulgent, glowing, and surrounded in radiance. I fell down on the ground in pranama, amazed at what was occurring. Srila Prabhupada arriving home. Srila Prabhupada was again seeing the object of his worship, Radha Damodar. And after a long separation, I was again seeing the object of my worship, Srila Prabhupada. It, 
it's a beautiful spot there, just incredibly beautiful. Those old temples built about 500 years ago. And uh, you, the, the deity of Radha Damodar is one of the original deities of the six Goswamis. And you enter to the left, and there's Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswamis, who wrote the Chaitanya Charitamrita. His samadhi is, is right there, his burial spot, as well as, as uh, Jiva Goswami. The Radha Damodar temple was Jiva Goswami's temple. And Rupa Goswami, and uh, the Prabhupada had come, and it was there back in the back part behind the courtyard where Rupa Goswami, Samadhi, and uh, Bhajan Kutir are, that Prabhupada held the, uh, the, the uh, month-long program on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And of course, for how many of you have been to Vrindavan? Okay, great, great. I mean, Vrindavan is, has 5,000 temples, Krishna temples, Radha Krishna temples. There's Radha Govindaji. The original uh, Radha Govinda is in Jaipur now. But there, there's a Govindaji, and there's a small Govindaji temple behind the big one. And then there's Radha Damodar, Radha Sham Sundar, uh, uh, Madan Mohan on the hill. Beautiful temple on the hill. And so many t- temples that are more recent. There's a temple devoted to Mirabai with a beautiful fountain. And there's a temple called the Shaji Temple near Loy Bazaar that has this massive big temple with these uh, pillars that are tw- twirling white marble. They go like this. And it's a huge temple, but you go inside and the deities are only this big. <laughs> so it's very kind of sweet to see such grandeur and yet the deities are so small. Um, But there was, every day, there was about 40 or 50 devotees that were there to listen to Prabhupada as he spoke daily on, on Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And of course, Prabhupada translated Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and that's our book that we read, The Nectar of Devotion. Every morning and evening, there in Rupa Goswami's presence, Surrounded by 25 to 50 devotees, Prabhupada sat in his state of deep Krishna conscious meditation and trance. And there, in that divine and holy location, Srila Prabhupada would lecture, talk of, and expound upon Srila Rupa Goswami's teachings. This was a time that spiritual life was a reality. This was a time when there was no doubts or reservations. This was a time here under Srila Prabhupada's care and within the field of his divine presence and aura when spiritual life was completely tangible. The combination of this holy land of Vrindavan Dham and Srila Prabhupada's direct connection with Sri Krishna was so profound that the spiritual world opened up to us all. So uh, that was one month. Kartik is October, middle of October to middle of November, 1972. And, and so many wonderful things we did for during that month. We, Prabhupada, but at that time there was no Krishna Balaram temple. The, the Iskans, we were all staying in, in this palace on the Keshi Ghat that was being allowed to us by the Maharaj of Bharatpur. He, he had, uh, Gurudas had arranged this and, and the devotees, about 50 devotees were there. We were all staying at this, this Maharaja's palace. And Prabhupada was staying at Radha Dampadar. And we used to get to go and, and be with Prabhupada at, at, at uh, Radha Dampadar. And I remember going into his rooms and the air and the walls and everything was just shimmering with ecstasy. I mean, it's, it's really very hard to convey what it was like to be in Prabhupada's presence. In Prabhupada's presence, everything is, is just divine. Every, all all uh, your anxiety goes and you're in a you know, joyful realization of the spiritual truths 
being in Prabhupada's presence. And we had that opportunity in Vrindavan to, to visit Prabhupada in his small rooms on a number of occasions. So that was really just uh, very, very fortunate on, on our, our part. I, I remember one time we were taking a walk with Prabhupada in the morning and one disciple was imitating the sadhus of India, you know, barefoot. And Prabhupada said, you shouldn't go barefoot, you can cut your foot. And I thought how pra practical and thoughtful of Prabhupada to tell the disciple, right? Because you know a lot of those sadhus in India, you see them barefoot. And so the Western sadhus want to be like that, you know, imitate them. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of devotees. It was wonderful. That was a very wonderful time there. Um, after that month in, in Vrindavan, Prabhupada went to Ahmedabad. He went to Delhi and then to Ahmedabad. There was a big program in Ahmedabad. And uh, then in Bombay, he stayed with Kartikeya Mahadevya, who was a very nice man and his family. They were wealthy f people. They had lived up on the sixth or seventh floor overlooking the Arabian Sea. Uh, and every, and Prabhupada stayed there. And, and uh, every evening we'd come over to hear Prabhupada talk. And we'd come and knock on the, go take the elevator up to the seventh floor, go down and give a gentle knock. Shruti Kirti would come to the door. And he was always so welcoming, invited us in. And we sat on the plush rug overlooking the Arabian Sea. And then after some time, Prabhupada would come out. I'll read this. Srila Prabhupada stayed during this period at the home of Kartikeya Mahadevya. Kartikeya lived in a beautiful hilly part of Mumbai up on the sixth or seventh floor. Every day the devotees came, I said all of this, with, uh, with a gentle knock, Shruti Kirti would come to the door. Without fail, he always greeted the devotees with, well, Shruti Kirti was such a nice devotee. You know, he had that position of traveling with Prabhupada. But he always tried to open up an opportunity for devotees to come and sit with Prabhupada. So we really appreciate that he was so hospitable, so generous. Um, and then Srila Prabhupada, glowing in effulgence, would enter the room accompanied by his secretary, Sham Sundar. The devotees would immediately bow down to Srila Prabhupada, who was beaming, radiating divinity and spiritual realization. His mind was ever clear and pure and surrendered always at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Joy emanated from him. The name of Krishna was always on his lips. As Srila Prabhupada entered the room, the miracle reoccurred. The room transformed into Vaikuntha. We were no longer in the Mahadevya household or on the shore of the Arabian Sea. Instead, Sitting there in Srila Prabhupada's presence, we were in Goloka Vrindavan. Now, the reason that Prabhupada was in Bombay, Mumbai, is because they were having this huge uh, Pandal program. They had had it the previous year also. Um, huge. Uh, uh, you know, how many of you know Bombay? Are you, any of you from there? You know, Churchgate Station, just across where Cross Maidan is, a block or two away, there's that big, wide open area. And they were erecting this pandal, as only they can do in India, such a massive, big tent. And it was so big, I thought, how is it that we're making a tent so big when we can't get that many people? I mean, this was as big as a huge city square block. I thought, how, how, could, how could we get such a... Uh, how, how is it that we're making such a big tent? So let me read about that. During the day, we would be involved in the preparations for the upcoming Cross Maidan Pandal Festival. As the massive tent for the program is being erected, I was astounded by its size. It seems huge. Could we really expect that many people? On the day the program began, to my awe and amazement, the tent grew packed. Like a tent stadium, there must have been easily 10,000 people there. And everyone was filled with great excitement and anticipation. And they waited. As they waited, 
for the appearance of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, I soon discovered that the people of Mumbai have great love and hold great respect for Srila Prabhupada. Each evening, Srila Prabhupada came up on the stage surrounded by his disciples. As he delivered his discourse on Sanatan Dharma and Krishna Bhakti to this crowd of 10,000, they were absolutely silent. The entire crowd remained fully focused, trance-like, on Srila Prabhupada's words. Amazingly, here, amongst this huge crowd, the miracle began to manifest. Srila Prabhupada actually created a shift in consciousness, a shift into the spiritual dimension. Yeah, uh, it was, Prabhupada was that powerful. That the, Prabhupada, in front of 10,000 people, he cre- there was a transformation. And, and the, but, I mean, all of the people were so respectful to Prabhupada. It was just wonderful. Now, after that, there was, uh, uh, Prabhupada went, I believe, up to Mayapur, after, after Mumbai. Um, now, my visa, just like in Trinidad, my visa after one year in India ran out, and it was very difficult to get them extended. Uh, so we had to leave India uh, in, in May of 1973, uh, but uh, had such a wonderful experience there during that, first, that, during that year. And uh, I, as I, when I had flown to India, I'd stopped in London, because the flights normally stop in London. So on the way back, also stop in London. And uh, stopping in London, um, at that time, things were really going in a wonderful way in London. All the, the, the temple they had on Bury Place was just full of devotees young brahmacharis with their shaved heads and sikas, tilak and tulsi beads. And um, it was just packed with, with the devotees. And um, at that time, George Harrison had just purchased the manor. You all know about Bhaktivedanta Manor. That's the big 17-acre complex in, in north, just north of London that was purchased by George Harrison as a, the center of Krishna consciousness in, in, uh, in England. And it was about to open up in about a week. We arrived just perfect timing. The, 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 it was about to open up. And uh, it's a big, huge Tudor style. You know what Tudor style is? It's the kind of a white material that has surrounded by w- w- wooden beams of some kind. You know, it's, it's a certain style of architecture. And it was interesting to note that that in 1485, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, appeared in 1486. So one would say in the year of his conception, 1485, that was the year of the Tudor era in British history. And, uh, and, and Henry VII and Henry VIII were actually the Tudor kings during the whole time that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had his pastimes on earth. So the whole Tudor style architecture was developed in England at the time that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was on the earth. So I make note of the fact that it's kind of appropriate that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's headquarters in London would be of Tudor style. And, and I was also noting that uh, if one thinks about what was going on in the world at the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, presence on this earth, uh, you know, if, if Christopher Columbus had actually succeeded in finding the east coast of India, which is what he was trying to find. Uh, he would have encountered Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a seven-year-old lad charming the residents of Navadweep because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would have been about seven years old in 1492. And 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was about probably 12 years old when Vasco da Gama first landed on the west coast of India. And Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel right at the same time that, that uh, like 1510, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned from his travels in South India, about 1517, that was the year that Martin Luther was nailing the, his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg ch Cathedral. And he, the year of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left his manifest pastimes in 1534. That was the year that the Church of England separated, and that's the year it started because it separated from the Roman Church. So I thought that was... And of course, in India, for the whole 15th and 16th century, there was the huge bhakti movement that was going on. First to set the stage for Chaitanya, it was all done to set the stage, and then after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared as a consequence and result of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But um, the London Temple, for those of you who haven't been there, it's worth making a trip to see. It's just a magnificent project they have there. And uh, we were very, very fortunate to be with Prabhupada at that time. I remember uh, before the, the devotees were working on... on uh, getting the new temple room ready. So in the meantime, there was another, another room that was uh, used as the temple room. And I, I remember when we, we uh, attended Prabhupada's daily classes, just the wonderful, wonderful transcendental presence of Prabhupada to be there with Prabhupada. It was, it was so uh, auspicious and so fortunate. Prabhupada would walk down those hallowed halls as devotees were on both sides, and he would talk to them and greet them in a very fatherly, loving way. And Shamsundar had arranged a different speaker uh, every night because he were there in London. He wanted to have uh, different people come to meet Prabhupada. And practically every evening had been filled uh, with a different speaker. Um, but there were a few evenings that had not been filled yet, and so, so uh, uh, Shamsundar um, informed the devotees, if you meet anybody of significance or importance that would be good as a guest to bring to Prabhupada, then let me know, because we want to fill every evening with a new important uh, visitor. For example, uh, Arnold Toynbee, the great historian, came to visit Prabhupada or, you know, various people of importance came during that period. Well, I, I would go out during the day to Wembley, where there's a big Indian population, and I was, would sell Krishna books. And, and uh, I, while I was there, I discovered that this important Shankaracharya was, who was traveling in England at the time and uh, was speaking on a sp speaking engagement. So I asked Shamsundar, Shall I invite this Shankaracharya? And Shamsundar, who was very uh, anxious, to, enthusiastic to fulfill uh, fill every night, he said, oh, great, yes, bring him. Yeah, we can schedule that on the calendar. So anyway, a week or ten days later, whenever it was that I was scheduled to bring him, I got in the little vehicle to drive off to Wembley to get him. And in the meantime, Shamsundar, Prabhupada's servant, informed Prabhupada that your guest this evening will be the Shankaracharya. Well, Prabhupada said, Vaishnav sannyasis don't see Shankaracharyas. Where's Vaikuntana? Tell him not to get him. <laughs> well, I didn't know. We didn't have cell phones in those days. I had gone off to get the Shankaracharya. And I, I was bringing, bringing him back. When I arrived back, I thought, oh, I'm doing a nice, I'm doing a, an appropriate service here. I brought, little did I know what had transpired while I was gone. It wasn't actually, he didn't want to see the Shankaracharya. Well, once Prabhupada learned that, that I had come, of course, he told me to bring him in. Now, you never would have known that, that he was not a welcome guest because Prabhupada received him in such a gracious manner with such warmth and such expertise 
of how to interact with people. Immediately, the Shankaracharya accepted his junior position. It was very apparent that, I mean, Prabhupada was so, so heavy, so powerful. You know, there was no, this, this Shankaracharya was, was junior. And within minutes, the Shankaracharya was smiling and very happy and, and Prabhupada. But, of course, the reason that, that Prabhupada and the Vaishnavas don't want to see the Shankaracharyas is because they, they, uh, don't ex- they disclaim our beloved. They say, you know, Godhead is impersonal. They're denying the Vaishnavas' object of love, so naturally Vaishnavas don't want to interact with them. But it was very nice the way that Prabhupada treated him. I, I just in every sort of encounter with Prabhupada, I just saw the incredible the, the, uh, expertise at which Prabhupada interacted with people in such a way that anybody who encountered Prabhupada was was blessed, just greatly blessed by that. I, I was there when Donovan. Have you, have you ever heard of the singer Donovan? He was popular in the in the 1960s. He came to visit Prabhupada. And uh, one night I was in the, uh, my apartment, or a little room where I, I slept, and I, there was a hurried knock on the door. By Kuntanath, come quickly, come quickly. Shamsundar wants you to bring the key to the book room. I used to be in charge of that book warehouse. Shamsundar wants the key to the book room. So I ran down, and he was showing George Harrison the, the property. So I had a chance to meet George Harrison. And, and uh, George Harrison, of course, is the one who graciously had purchased the whole place. And he had just come over to, to see the place. And Ginsburg was there. And, and n- numerous people had come to see Srila Prabhupada. And after Prabhupada, Prabhupada was there for the whole summer. Uh, on John Mostomy, there was a grand and glorious opening celebration. Wonderful opening celebration. Uh, a few thousand people were there. A big stage was set up. Prabhupada's doors were open. All the devotees were invited in to be with Prabhupada. And uh, it was, it was um, re- really wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful grounds. That, that Bhakti- and by the way, if you ever go to dandavats.com, there's a great uh, little uh, video clip of about 10 minutes that they just produced about the Bhaktivedanta Manor. If you want to get a sense of what they're doing there, it's, it's really very impressive. Um, well, um, what happened was after, I, uh, after Prabhupada had left uh, uh, London, I stayed on there for that whole remaining year. And then in June, of 74, um, Prabhupada, in his travels, was scheduled to go to Germany. And um, what happened was, Prabhupada always traveled with, with a, a secretary and also a, a person to transcribe, because Prabhupada was always working on his, his translation work. You know, he would only sleep three or four hours at night at most, and most of the night he was translating. Uh, and so he needed somebody to take and listen to that dictaphone and type it onto a page and then send it to Los Angeles where it would be further readied for publication. Um, and Nitai, who did that particular service, uh, was ill. He had some illness, you know, traveling around you could get ill. You know, even they'd just come from India and... and I think he had some stomach problem or something. Um, anyway, they needed a replacement for problem. For, for, and there, there were hundreds of devotees there. They needed a replacement. The, the only qualifications you needed was you, knew, you had to know how to type, and, and you also had to know how to transliterate Bengali, which, which uh, sounds very difficult, but transliterating is quite simple. You just have to know the character. It's not that you know the language. You just know the characters, so you have to be able to transliterate well, nobody there knew how to do both, but I did. And to my, to my amazement, I got to act as the substitute for Nitai and to travel with Prabhupada because I, I uh, 
had taken a, high, a, a typing class in high school. And when I was in India the previous year, they sell on the train station, learn Bengali in 30 days. You know those books? Every train station, learn Hindi in 30 days, learn Tamil in 30, 30 days. Right? You can't learn a language in 30 days, but you can at least learn the characters. And so I had purchased that learn Bengali in 30 days, and I learned the characters. And so I actually got the job to travel with Prabhupada. And uh, that was, the, un, without a doubt, the, the high point in my life. And that was why I felt it was my duty to, to you know, put down my memories, because Krishna was so kind to allow me to, to have that job, so I wanted to write down the memories in the book. And, and the book just, it just came out. It's only out now a matter of a couple of weeks. And I've sold about 30 copies. I only printed 200 copies. So it's a very limited edition. It's not for everyone. It's for those who like to hear stories like these about Prabhupada. It's $11. It's available afterwards if you like. And the money all goes to the Mayapur project. So. Um, So, after what happened was Prabhupada first flew to Australia, and and from Australia, uh, I mean there was many wonderful things that happened in Australia. Uh, but then I uh, uh, write down the the uh, after we left Australia, because after we left Australia, uh, it, there was just uh, uh, Satsvarupa and myself accompanying Prabhupada for that particular flight. Uh, there, there weren't a lot of devotees. On some of Prabhupada's flights, there would be a lot of devotees. From Australia, Srila Prabhupada flew to Hawaii. The plane had a scheduled stop in Fiji for three or four hours. Fiji is a very small place, small airport. The plane had a scheduled stop in Fiji for three or four hours. Only two devotees accompanied Srila Prabhupada on this flight to Hawaii, Satsvarupa and myself. Satsvarupa was suffering from a swollen knee and painful knee. So when we arrived in Fiji, he needed to stay on board the plane to rest his knee. Srila Prabhupada and I got up and walked through the narrow aisle to the front door. As we exited the plane and descended the stairway, to the airport ground, we were welcomed by the most beautiful tropical air. It was night. Everything was still. There was a beautiful moon in the sky. Srila Prabhupada walked across the tarmac and st stood near some coconut palm trees as I followed next to him. He was totally relaxed and peaceful. He didn't say a word to me, nor me to him. He just stood there, hand in bead bag, chanting, observing, looking across the palm tree filled night. After half an hour or so, he walked further and then stopped again. It was magical to be there with Srila Prabhupada in this place of incredible tropical beauty and perfect climate surrounded by coconut palm trees and lush tropical plants with that beautiful white moon against the dark sky. Srila Prabhupada was to my right and I was to his left. At one point, I was standing at just the right angle to look across into Srila Prabhupada's eyes. That moment was to me the most profound moment in my life. Those dark brown eyes were deeper than the ocean. Those dark brown eyes were the window into the soul of a pure devotee of the Lord, a resident of Krishna, a resident of Krishna Loka, who was interacting with this material realm just to help us, the fallen residents of Bur Loka. The word guru is sometimes translated as heavy. 
in those eyes, one could recognize someone so heavy, so grave, so spiritually powerful. It struck me again that the powerful minds and powerful thinkers of the world are lightweights next to Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada's state of consciousness was so profoundly deep, so fully awakened, so grave and serious, and so deeply loving Krishna. This experience was very different than interacting with an ordinary person. Srila Prabhupada was centered in Krishna. He was so deeply situated in Krishna consciousness that nothing could ever come close to pulling him from that Krishna consciousness. He was much, much, much too deeply centered in Krishna for anything to distract him, like the flickering, lightweight minds of the earthly residents of Kali Yuga. He was far, far stronger than anything that Maya, anything then that Maya could produce. This experience was so profound for me because there, alone with Prabhupada, I recognized that I was not dealing with an ordinary human being at all. I was dealing with a divine being who had descended onto this plane but was not part of it. I was dealing with a person who was in an entirely different state of consciousness than anything that exists in our ordinary experience. This was a being who was in a deep, deep state of God consciousness, Krishna consciousness. Although there was a world of Iskhan devotees who longed to be with him and near him, there I was, totally alone with him, in this setting of pristine, tropical beauty. It was a long layover, three or four hours. There was no other airplanes in this small Fiji Island airport. There was a small waiting lounge off in the distance, but Srila Prabhupada chose to stay outside beneath those palm trees. Walking with Prabhupada in that environment was the greatest possible experience. I was so fortunate. About an hour and a half passed in this way, although it seemed eternal. Srila Prabhupada chanted softly on his japa beads. Neither Srila Prabhupada nor I spoke the entire time. There was no need to. Suddenly, in the distance, to my utter shock and surprise, coming seemingly out of nowhere, appeared a devotee. A saffron-clad, shaven-headed, tilak-marked, Iskhan devotee. He ran toward Srila Prabhupada, and about a hundred feet away, he fell to the ground with his forehead on the pavement, bowing humbly to his spiritual master. I was utterly amazed and astonished, and as far as I know, this was completely unexpected by Srila Prabhupada also. This devotee was very clean and a paka Vaishnava. He got up from the ground and humbly approached Srila Prabhupada, his hands together in supplication and prayer. He was so happy and overjoyed to see Srila Prabhupada. Following some distance behind this devotee appeared a small group of Fijian gentlemen. Somehow they got word that Srila Prabhupada was to be there. But again, as far as I could tell, Srila Prabhupada had not been informed that anyone would be meeting him at the airport. The group invited Srila Prabhupada to come inside the waiting lounge and sit with him. For the remaining hour and a half before boarding, Srila Prabhupada sat in the lounge with these devotees. He engaged with them in a warm and lively conversation. There was some talk of building a Krishna temple in Fiji. Years later, I learned that these men are the ones who later built the Kaliya Krishna Iskhan Temple in Fiji. They became the founding members of Iskhan Fiji, and their leader was named Vasudev Das. At one point during this meeting, Srila Prabhupada said to me, Vaikuntanath, take their name and address. I promptly wrote down the gentleman's name and address on a piece of paper and folded it up and put it in my pocket. Finally, after a wonderful meeting, it was time to reboard the aircraft. With numerous prayers and pranamas, these devotees bade farewell to Srila Prabhupada as he returned to the plane and ascended the stairs. Srila Prabhupada did not say a word to me about this 
unusual surprise of unexpectedly finding devotees there. As we ascended the stairs, I started to make a comment regarding the amazing surprise, but I discontinued because I could see that Srila Prabhupada was in a deep and transcendental mood. The Fijian devotees had given some prasadam, and I talk about distributing the prasadam. But yeah, that was just um, uh, an amazing you know, experience to, to be there alone with Prabhupada in, in Fiji. It's such a beautiful experience for me. And I just wanted to share that with people. You know, nobody knows that story other than me because, you know, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about writing down your Prabhupada memories is that everyone has their own memories of Prabhupada, even if you never met him personally, because Prabhupada appears in dreams and he appears in so many ways. Um, anyway, uh, uh, it, it goes on. It, 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 it says uh, how we flew off that night into the sky to Hawaii. And of course, Hawaii was a well-established center by that time. Of course, Sundar Das and Govinda Das, he had established Hawaii there and, and uh, I mean, had established this con there. Uh, we we flew from Hawaii to to Chicago, where a huge an old YMCA, I believe, had been purchased and was converted into an Iskon temple, and it had hundreds of devotees there, all so enthusiastic. And then from there, we flew to San Francisco, where again there were thousands. I don't know if it was thousands, but there was hundreds of devotees who were there. Uh, uh, in, in San Francisco because they were having the Rathiatra. Prabhupada had come for the Rathiatra. And then down to Los Angeles. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to jump and I'm going to read one story. After going to Los Angeles, we went to Dallas, where the Gurukul was. And from there, we went to New Vrindavan. And this story I like. Uh, New Vrindavan was also flourishing. We arrived at the Pittsburgh airport, and I described that, and then jumping ahead, at an old farmhouse on the side of a hill had been readied for Srila Prabhupada and his servants. My job, arriving at a new location, was to unpack some of the items and put them away. I was scurrying around putting various items in their place. Uh, Srila Prabhupada was seated on a mat on the floor with a low desk. Prabhupada always sat on the floor with a little small low desk in front of him, low desk in front. He asked me to set up the dictaphone machine on the table. Carefully, I placed the dictaphone on the desk, just inches in front of Srila Prabhupada, as he sat at the desk. Next, I unpacked the microphone and brought it over to plug into the dictaphone. I was holding the microphone about two feet above the dictaphone when instantly it slipped from my hands. It was the greatest possible blunder. There was a huge bang. In other words, I, I had the microphone. I was setting up the dictaphone for Brawl, but I dropped the microphone on top of the dictaphone. There was a huge bang as the microphone dropped two feet and crashed into the dictaphone. Srila Prabhupada always treated this machine with the greatest care. The dictaphone was an expensive item. More significantly, it was very hard to replace or to locate a supplier. In a few days, Srila Prabhupada was scheduled to fly to India, and he used this machine daily in his translation work. This brief moment of my blunder revealed a glimpse into the inner makeup and nature of a Goswami, a pure devotee. What was Srila Prabhupada's reaction in those microseconds after that loud and unexpected bang? The bang and jolt from the falling microphone were so abrupt and so loud that any ordinary person would have flinched there would have been some involuntary muscular reaction. Furthermore, most people would show some kind of negative reaction, some condemnation of such a careless mistake. 
and quite likely some instantaneous anger. But what was Srila Prabhupada's response in this situation? Indeed, his response was super, supra, supra mundane and superhuman and revealed his nature as a Goswami. So what was his response? There was no flinch or reflexive muscular act reaction, whatever, to the jolt, whatsoever to the jolt and to the loud bang. There was no shock or surprise, no anger, no negativity, no sign of disturbance, not a word of disapproval. He did not say a thing. He was the personification of pure tolerance, total self-control, kindness to his disciple, and continuous love for Krishna. This does not mean that a pure devotee will always show no response. That depends on the circumstances. But this does show that a pure devotee is not under the control of his, of his senses, as most people are. His senses did not dictate his actions or reactions. Rather, his senses were fully under his control, and he only used them as he saw fit in the service of Krishna. Someone might ask, is it possible for a pure devotee or a Goswami to ever show anger? Yes, it is possible. A pure devotee might use anger to bring someone closer to Krishna, or to protect Krishna's devotee, or to defend Krishna. There are so many ways that anger might be utilized in the service of Krishna. But a pure devotee is never controlled by anger. In this particular situation, where I dropped the microphone, Srila Prabhupada did not find anger useful. Although it is possible that a pure devotee, I make this a little footnote, although it is possible that a pure devotee may, may use anger in Krishna's service, personally, I, I've never witnessed Srila Prabhupada express any form of anger whatsoever. Now, one a, a, a other story I want to read. Um, this is after we've returned and we've landed in Vrindavan again. At the, at the end, we, we went to uh, Vrindavan. Uh, one day in Vrindavan, Srila Prabhupada called for me. Vaikuntanath? Please bring the name and address of the gentleman we met in Fiji. Remember I was given, asked to get his name? Please bring the name and address of the gentleman we met in Fiji. I bowed down and said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. But as I left the room, my stomach sank. Our visit to Fiji had been two months ago. And those two months had been an unending whirlwind of activity. I had not given that address a second thought since we left Fiji. I ran to my room as fast as I could. As I ran, I prayed, Oh, Lord Krishna, please, let that address be where it is supposed to be. <laughs> Panting and out of breath, I swung open the door, ran inside, and scrambled to my attaché case. I unlocked and threw open the attaché case, unbuttoned the top file, and fumbled it open. As, as I held my breath and looked in, I didn't know if it was going to be there or not, or if I'd lost it. Thank you, Lord Krishna. Thank you, Lord Krishna, for by your grace, the address on that paper was there, <laughs> where it was supposed to be. I was so relieved and happy. By Krishna's grace, I had not lost it. I immediately turned around and ran back to Srila Prabhupada's room to deliver the piece of paper. I felt good because I felt that Srila Prabhupada was pleased with me. I have always felt that there was a very important lesson in this. I was traveling with Srila Prabhupada. If one is to serve the Lord and the Lord's devotee, they must do things in a responsible and organized way. If they do not, then it is not a very high level of service. Srila Prabhupada always assumed that his disciples would have a certain level of skill, and he expected them to show responsibility in their service. This test certainly taught me the importance of that. Um, 
I, I, I assume that that clock is correct, and I was told that I could go until 8. Yep. So that means I have 10 minutes. So that gives me time for one more story. Um, other than when I was in Trinidad and Guyana, I've rarely given a lecture or class or led a kirtan. This is no doubt due to some degree of shyness inherent in my nature. One day at the nearly completed Krishna Balaram temple, Srila Prabhupada was present along with a large gathering of devotees. The moment came when, when someone would normally begin to lead the kirtan, no one began singing. I grabbed the moment, took a leap, and began leading the kirtan. I could tell that Srila Prabhupada noticed and that he was pleased. Srila Prabhupada was perfectly aware that I never led kirtan and that, and that I was somewhat shy. And I could tell that Srila Prabhupada was happy for me that I took on this challenge. I led, as best I could, the prayers to the spiritual master and then the prayers to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Panchatattva. Finally, I began chanting Hare Krishna. After a few minutes of my leading the kirtan, one prominent devotee stepped in, and with the greatest expertise and timing, and without missing a beat, took over the lead. He did it so expertly and with such self-confidence that no one really noticed that I had been usurped right in the middle of the kirtan. But Srila Prabhupada did not miss a, th miss a thing, and he certainly noticed this. He looked over at me, with full recognition of the obvious injustice of my being so blatantly ousted from leading the kirtan, the memory of that look of empathy, compassion, and understanding that Srila Prabhupada gave to me is one of the most valuable treasures I have. That memory reminds me of Srila Prabhupada's kindness, sensitivity, and sense of justice. Srila Prabhupada fully expressed that entire emotion in his look toward me. But then, after expressing that em empathy, he completely let that emotion go, and he was back, absorbed in the chanting. It was amazing how quickly Srila Prabhupada made that transition. But that was because Srila Prabhupada is a pure devotee. He did not hanker, and he did not lament. He did not cling to the past but was ever in the present, fully connected to Sri Krishna. It was a state of consciousness very distinct from the consciousness normally encountered by the denizens of this material world. Well, it's a great privilege and a great honor for me to have been given an opportunity to speak before you I, uh, you know, have spent the last couple of years in my spare time working on this book, and I guess the real culmination of writing a book is to be able to come before people and present it. So this is uh, very uh, important for, for me, and I thank you all very much for coming and listening to me speak. And I would have five more minutes if anyone has any comments or questions. Uh, does anyone have a comment or question? Uh, so I, I, if not, then I, I have uh, one of two options. One is to read another story or to just stop here. Should, should I read another one? Or? Yeah. One memory, this is going back to 1969, April, when Prabhupada had come to New York. 
They were still on 2nd Avenue. It's at the new place on 2nd Avenue. One memory from this time is very clear. After presenting his lecture, Srila Prabhupada would always ask if there were any questions. There was a devotee named Madhavi Lata. She had been initiated 11 months earlier at the same time as me in Boston. Madhavi Lata had a somewhat troubled and slightly aggressive personality. She had a little mental illness of some kind. Uh, she responded to people in, in an unpredictable way. After Srila Prabhupada's lecture, to everyone's surprise, Madhavi Lata presented a question to Srila Prabhupada with a challenging and sarcastic tone. Srila Prabhupada patiently and lovingly answered her question. After the lecture, as Srila Prabhupada walked down 2nd Avenue back to his apartment, he stopped on the northwest corner of 2nd and 3rd Avenue, or street. Seven or eight devotees, seven or eight disciples accompanied Srila Prabhupada. As Srila Prabhupada stopped there on the corner, all of the disciples circled around to listen. Srila Prabhupada asked, with the greatest expression of compassion and concern, he said, Madhavi Lata is not doing well? Printed words cannot convey the kindness of Srila Prabhupada's tone and expression. It was profoundly touching to me to see the compassion and depth in Srila Prabhupada's eyes and his genuine and deeply felt concern for his disciples' well-being. I was greatly impressed to see the kindness within his heart. And there was an additional dimension as to why I was impressed. Amongst Srila Prabhupada's disciples there, there with him were Brahmananda and Rishi Kumar and others who were all known as no-nonsense tough leaders. Right? They, did, they, 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 they would not be sympathetic to Madhavi Lata's outburst. They would have been critical of her outburst, or they might have even rejected her for being offensive. However, when they witnessed Srila Prabhupada's deep level of concern and compassion towards her, they also became very concerned about Madhavi Lata. They too, extremely, they too became extremely caring about her spiritual well-being and welfare. They too, followed, following Srila Prabhupada's example, were kind-hearted and compassionate. The whole experience was really very beautiful and we were left with no doubt about Srila Prabhupada's uncomprising love for his disciples and his love for humanity. Hare Krishna. So, it's one minute to eight. Arti is about to begin. And as I say, I don't mean to sound like a salesman or anything, but if anybody's interested in this, this is available for $11. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So we'll keep the asans in, in their places and we'll get ready for Aarti.